Hi, everyone. Welcome to Melissa and Lori Love Literacy. We're so excited because today we are diving deep into read alouds and sharing practical tips for teachers. And we're here with a returning guest, Molly Ness. Um, she's a former teacher, a professor, an author, and currently vice president of academic content at Learning Ally. And most exciting, she recently wrote a book titled Read Alouds for All Learners. Welcome, Molly. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Yeah, we can't wait. This is going to be such a fun episode. We get so many questions about read alouds and I just think this is practical for teachers in every grade. And we got a sneak preview of your book. It's super awesome. So a little plug there for that. Yeah. We'll also have you share more about that uh, at the and end. Really if that's practical. Okay. It's, <laughs> really practical. It's really practical, which is great. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I, tr I tried to write the book that I wish I had as, a, as an early career teacher to help me plan my read alouds. Absolutely. Yeah. So important. Well, that feels like a good place to start. <laughs> Yeah, and I think we should start just even with what is a read aloud? I know that seems like such a simple question, but I think we often have different interpretations of what that term means. So I'm going to let you jump in to talk about what it is. Sure. Well, I'm specifically focusing on the interactive, language-rich experience between a teacher and a child or a group of children. And we know that there are so many different formats of read-alouds. Um, kids can read to each other. Kids can read to stuffed animals or dogs. Um, parents can read to children. And there is powerful research about all of those as well. But I was really looking at um, the teacher uh, facilitated read aloud across content areas and um, really K through eight. I, I um, want to push against the idea that read alouds are the purview of our early childhood educators or even our childhood educators or that read alouds belong only in the, uh, the reading block. Um, so the focus really is reading aloud, teacher in front of whatever grade level of students, pre-K through eight, and in, um, integrating those read alouds in all different content areas and times of the day. I wanted to ask about, there's one part of your book that talks about audio books, and it stuck out to me when I was thinking about, is, there, is an audio book a read aloud? Does that count? <laughs> Yeah, so I actually, um, I dug into this research a little bit because when my daughter was um, doing her readathon at her elementary school, we logged in all of the minutes that we listened to an audiobook. And because we travel far for different sports competitions, we had, you know, just a ton of minutes and nobody believed that we had, quote unquote, read so many minutes. And um, so it actually started this whole great conversation. Does a read aloud, uh, does listening to a read aloud have the same benefits? Does it count? And we have some really compelling research um, from people like Stanislas Dehan, who I know we all have sort of a fangirl reading crush on, who um, explains that the language parts of the brain go through the same activation, involvement, engagement um, when we listen to a book as when we actually read it. So in the words of Daniel Willingham, which I actually borrow for the book, fly that audiobook flag loud and proud because there <laughs> is um, such a benefit. Oh, I love that. And actually, I love that because I, I just bought his book on audiobook. So <laughs> I his book on audiobook too. too. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. That that actually is really awesome, Molly. I'm so glad that we talked about that, Melissa. That was a really, really good question. And I love that you brought that up like right off the bat. So <laughs> thank you for that info. So Molly, if we could think about why read alouds are important and what the research says about them, that would be really helpful. Sure. Um, well, as um, grateful as I am for this sort of particular moment in our literacy landscape where there's so much conversation about the science of reading, I have felt it has been really focused on the constrained skills of word recognition and decoding. And, um, and so there's been some sort of misinformation or confusion around, well, do, where do read alouds fit in the science of reading? And um, my argument and all of the data shows that Re uh, that read-alouds are really 
probably the best effective research-based way to facilitate language comprehension growth. So when we think about that Scarborough rope, as we all um, love and know so well, um, read-alouds are the way that we get to build background knowledge, expose kids to um, funds of knowledge, introduce vocabulary, um, and all of those meaningful unconstrained skills which contribute so much to comprehension. So um, there's been, I'm st trying to also push against the idea that, that read alouds say there's, that, that the science of reading says there's no time or place for read alouds. In fact, um, the research is really compelling and we actually know some, some pretty fascinating research. I think we're all sort of familiar with the research that shows that read alouds um, increase kids' uh, early language skills, vocabulary, those sorts of things. But I also found some stuff that was pretty interesting. So um, in particular, I was just blown away by some research that shows physiological benefits of read-alouds. And let me walk through um, an, exper an experiment that happened in a neonatal intensive care unit. So a researcher based out of University of Virginia um, looked at what happened to read-alouds of medically fragile babies. So these were babies that had been born prematurely. They were sort of connected to all sorts of wires and monitoring and in those sort of incubators. Um, and and uh, what would happen when parents read aloud to them. So we know that um, parents who have children in the neonatal a neonatal intensive unit often are, they struggle with how to interact with their baby. They're, you know, fragile, they're a little intimidated by the machinery and such, and so um, oftentimes mothers in particular uh, go through periods of postpartum depression. They can't take their babies home as, as, as well as they might have been able to were it a medically robust baby. So this experiment created three different types of reading. A whisper read for very short durations of, um, of, period, of time period for the really most medically fragile babies all the way up to sort of a normal speaking, longer duration to the babies that were just about to be discharged. And what the researchers found is that those babies, their oxygen rates increased and their heartbeats decreased, meaning all of those things that happen in our body when we are relaxed, when we are enjoying experiences. And not only did we see that increase in oxygen level and the decrease in heart rate, Rate during the read aloud, it lasted for about 20 minutes, 20 to 30 minutes after the read aloud. And these interviewers, these researchers actually then went and interviewed parents as well. And the mothers who uh, were um, experiencing postpartum depression said that they they felt better. They knew what to do now with their babies. They weren't sure how to interact them with them previously. And now we have hand them a book and they know what to do and that they were more... Um, determined to read aloud to their babies after taking them home. So we start to see physiological benefits, and we're also seeing it in adults that um, when people in um, adulthood listen to read alouds, we see an increase in neurotransmitters um, like oxytocin, the neurotransmitter that deals with pleasure and enjoyment. So some pretty compelling research that's just starting to look at not only how our linguistic, our vocabulary, all those literacy skills, but literally how listening to a read aloud shapes our body and transforms us. That is Such so a neat. fascinating study. I know. I can't believe, like, who would have even thought to do that? I think that's so cool. <laughs> yeah. I felt like I was having story time, and I wanted you to tell me this, <laughs> what, 12 years ago or 11 years ago when press was in the NICU. I would have done mm -hmm. it. <laughs> yes. And actually, they um, another set of researchers looked at children who were hospitalized and found that when they listened to read alouds, their levels, uh, their self-reported levels of pain and discomfort um, decreased oh, wow. just by listening to a read aloud. So lots and lots of compelling um, research around read alouds, not just in the classroom, but in, you know, life settings and all of these different conditions. Um, but of course, we're here to talk about read alouds in the classroom. <laughs> we are, we are. Yeah, but I was going to say real quick before we move from that, I, I do feel like I hear a lot of teachers who say this is one of their favorite times, you know, of the day is when they get to just read aloud to their students. And 
I wonder if it's a similar, uh, you know, the similar things happening. <laughs> sure. And, and, and that takes me back to my first um, classroom experience. I was um, a classroom teacher in Oakland, California, and um, there was the time of day that kids came back all revved up, amped up <laughs> yeah. from recess slash <laughs> lunch. You know, they're all sweaty because we were in California. Um, they were ready to, you know, recount the the drama and um, conflict on the playground and um, <laughs> that I didn't know much as a first year teacher but I knew that they needed to like sit and p calm their bodies and refocus their energy and for us the read aloud was that period so it was our um, our sort of welcome back to class let's recenter let's refocus let's transition um, and at the time then I didn't know all of the other benefits of it I just knew it was an easy enjoyable transition for all of us so I just met with a fifth grade teacher um, and she has said the same exact thing she she I saw her schedule that was listed on the day and she had read aloud right after they came back from lunch and recess and I had asked her about it and I could see her like trying to defend it as if I was going to like like, why did you use that time for that? That's not on the list of things you're supposed to do. And I was like, I think that's the perfect thing to do at that time. <laughs> it's like right right at the right time for, for just like you said, like recentering and, and letting them calm. But also you're getting so many other benefits from it too, right? Not just sure. calming, but it does have that effect too. Well, can we jump into some nitty gritty specifics now? Sure, <laughs> I'd love to. All right. So in your book, you actually share a really clear three-step process for planning read-alouds. So I'm wondering if you could walk our listeners through those steps and, and how they help to, to set them up for success for reading aloud. Sure. Well, um, let me um, just back up with a tiny bit of context to those steps. So yeah. another thing that... Um, I was pretty. Uh, I was pretty surprised to find that um, we know there's a decline in read alouds at, right now. Um, read alouds are decreasing not only in frequency, but certainly decreasing as kids get older. So you know, K through two teachers might read aloud more frequently than um, you know a fifth grade teacher or seventh grade teacher. But to me, the most staggering study I found, and it resonates with me when I was an early career teacher, is that 50 to 70% of teachers don't plan their read alouds. Other than, here's the book I'm going to read. They don't go through and examine for instructional opportunities and stopping points and all of those things. And what we know is that when we look at the read aloud as just sort of a um, impromptu, I'll have some brilliant instructional moment come to me as I'm reading, um, we miss opportunities. Um, and actually there's been some discourse analysis studies of the language that teachers use while reading aloud um, when they plan intentionally versus when it's sort of that more impromptu experience. And teachers tend to use more low-level questions. They tend to um, focus on vocabulary, which is not uh, necessarily that rich, meaningful tier two vocabulary like Beck talks about. Um, so I really, I thought about that myself. My, when I was a first year and early career teacher, my read aloud was, all right, I got 10 to 15 minutes. Here are the pages I'm going to read. And that's what I thought planning a read aloud. Yeah. Now I know that planning is, is a multi-step process. So for me, step number one is to evaluate. What I do is I evaluate the book for background knowledge, which um, we've got so much great conversation about the importance of background knowledge. I extend it to include funds of knowledge and not just background knowledge. Funds of knowledge sort of being sort of the social norms and cultural capitals that happen in books um, as well. Um, so I evaluate for the background knowledge, which the text assumes that my kids are going to know or that they need to know to um, bring to the page to, to make meaning. I also evaluate for instructional opportunities, like uh, I really want to make sure that I focus on this portion. So I just go through and I evaluate what um, are the, the benefits, what are the potential stumbling blocks, um, what do my kids need to know to be successful in preparing, the, in, in reading this text. 
in step number two, I explain and I engage. And I do two different ways of explaining and engaging. First of all, I focus on vocabulary. And I mentioned earlier um, the, those Isabel Beck as she, and her colleagues, as they would call them, those tier two words, those sophisticated words. So my kindergartners might know f hungry, so I can highlight the word famished in a picture book. So I evaluate for, I'm sorry, I, uh, I, I explain two different kinds of words. Words that you just have to know in the meaning of the book or as opposed to words I really want to teach. There certainly are lots and lots of vocabulary words in books. We can't get to them all. So some of those words I just want to explain and move on. Other words I'm really going to sort of teach at a deep level. Also in that step two, I explain. And what I do with explaining is I explain what I'm doing as a proficient reader to make meaning of text through think alouds. I use those first person narrative think alouds to explain how I'm making meaning. And I, um, I love think alouds. I um, have written a fair amount about them. In my experience, We've got all this data, observational data, assessment data, all sorts of knowledge about our kids are struggling to comprehend. And so what do we do? Well, we typically ask them questions, which really isn't actually building their comprehension. It's just getting more data to, to evaluate their comprehension. But a think aloud is like I'm cracking my head open and talking through the invisible process of making meaning. So I might say something like, hmm, I'm getting the sense here that the teacher is frustrated by how the kids are behaving. And you can see that first person narrative. That's how I show my thinking to my kids. So I explain it all. And then in my third and final stop, stop is this, I'm sorry, in my third and final step, I, ex I engage and I extend. So I engage my kids in cross-curricular activities. And there are just so many different ways. This is where we get to shine our creative lights on things that we're passionate about. And I also really look for literacy-rich activities. So ideas to extend the meaning of the book in reading, writing, thinking, uh, reading, writing, speaking, and listening, um, and really being purposeful about their connection to literacy. That is such a clear landscape of three steps, what to do. Again, I wish you were with me, you know, 20 years ago, Molly, um, or you wrote this 20. I'm glad you wrote it now. Um, <laughs> is it, it might be helpful to walk us through an example. Do you have an example you could walk us through? Sure. Well, the one that I often walk through is um, Knuffle Bunny by Mo Willems. And I do this book because so many of us know and love Mo Willems um, and because it's a relatively simple text but I want to sort of highlight how we could do that in um, just a simple text. So just a refresher, if people, um, it's been a while since they've read Knuffle Bunny or they don't know it, it's about a little girl named Trixie who lives in an urban area. She um, walks down the block with her dad to the laundromat. While she's walking, she's clutching her beloved stuffed animal. They get to the laundromat. Trixie helps her dad in the laundromat, although really she's, you know, being a, a preschooler and sort of being crazy and silly and playful. They walk back home and Trixie realizes her beloved stuffed animal has gone. She tries to tell her dad, but she speaks toddler ease and her dad can't understand her. They get home. Trixie's mom instantly recognizes the problem and says, where's Knuffle Bunny? And the rest of the story is them running back to the laundromat, searching for the stuffed animal. And um, the first words that Trixie ever says are Knuffle Bunny. So let's start with number one, evaluating um, sources of potential confusion as well as opportunity. So here to me is a great opportunity for background knowledge versus funds of knowledge. So background knowledge. My kids have to know what a laundromat is. There are lots of kids who don't. Maybe they have a washer and dryer in their home. Maybe they have somebody who does the laundry for them. Maybe um, they, you know, whatever their home situation is. They have to know that the laundromat is a public space where anybody can go to do their laundry. 
they also have to know sort of what it means to go down the block. If you have a kid who's living on a farm in Texas who has never seen a city block, you have to understand that it is a meaning of, um, it's a unit of distance or a measurement. But there's also some important funds of knowledge here, like what I mean, those cultural capitals, the way that my family operates is different than your family. And there are certainly things. First of all, not every kid has a beloved stuffed animal. So some kids, if they don't have a stuffed animal that they just drag with them everywhere, might be like, well, what's the big deal? She's lost her, you know, her stuffed rabbits. No, no big deal. Another cultural norm in this book is that Trixie's dad is the one who leaves to go do the laundry. That's the family in this family, their dynamic of household chores, not the same in every family. So that may be a potential stumbling block. So I would say to my kids, in this book, the book takes place in a laundromat. Maybe I show a Google image picture of a laundromat. Maybe I talk to them very briefly about who does the chores in your home? So I'm sort of getting some of those ideas out there so they're going to be successful to interact with the text. Then as I read the text, I, I highlight my um, important vocabulary. Off the top of my head, I remember the word bald. Trixie is so upset she bawls and she goes boneless. And those of us who have had um, toddler tantrums um, experience, we, we know what that's like. But um, we have to explain. It doesn't literally mean when she went boneless, her bones fell out of her body. It just means she's <laughs> so upset that she you know goes limp and she bald, great tier two vocabulary. My kids know cry, so I can give them a more sophisticated way to say it and say, bawling here is, uh, means she's, re she's crying so heavily she can't talk. So then at the end of the book, after I've wrapped up with my think alouds where I've cracked open my head and made my invisible process of, of understanding visible to my kids, I would do some ac extension activities. I might pull in um, some geometry. We might talk about city blocks and do some math around how many steps or how many feet go into a block or depending on whatever the mathematics skills of my students are. Um, this was one of the areas that I feel like I needed a little bit more support as an early teacher. I would do these activities which were kind of like the cutesy art mm -hmm. things but didn't really have a connection to literacy. So if I'm having my kids do coloring of um, here's, uh, you know, here's a, a stuffed animal, color it to make it look like your stuffed animal. Well, how is that helping my kids with reading, writing, speaking, or listening? And if I can't really justify the connection to reading, writing, speaking, or listening, I'm doing a cutesy activity and not a literacy rich activity. And my instructional time is so precious. I have to allot it for those literacy rich activities. Do you have any other examples of good literacy rich activities, Molly? For, for Nuffle Bunny, the specific text? Yeah, or just in general. I'm just like imagining teachers going, oh gosh, am I doing a literacy rich activity or am I doing a cutesy activity? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think, honestly, I think if you can justify it, this activity builds blank, my students blank by blank. So this activity, so if you have your kids turn and talk to their neighbor, how might Trixie have felt when she lost her bunny? And you say, turn and talk to your neighbor. That's facilitating oral language. If you are able to say, I am building my students blank language by blank, having them interact and engage in conversational turns with the neighbor, that's a literacy rich activity. But if I'm doing something that is taking paper plates and building paper plates, um, building a washing machine out of paper plates, cutesy activity more than a literacy rich. And certainly there are all sorts of creative ways to make some of these kind of art activities engaging in literacy rich. We could write directions, we could you know, do step-by-step -step things if that's our focus, but we just have to be really clear on what is my focus here, what am I building? Yeah. So helpful. I, I love the frame of like, how do we justify it in these reading, writing, speaking, and listening? That is really helpful to me because I know sometimes, you know, I see things and I'm like, oh, okay, that feels like a stretch, but I'm not sure exactly why. And you just named it really clearly. Like my students are doing this and it's helping them with this. That's, that's really helpful. Thank you. Yeah. 
And I don't ever want to sort of say like there's no time or place for some of these activities. You know, the Friday before Halloween at 2.30, <laughs> is it okay to have kids color pumpkins? Sure. I, you know, I, I get it, but, but that's not how we want to spend the vast majority of our instructional time. Our students yeah. need that literacy support. So that reading, writing, speaking, and listening. That's very helpful. All right. So you mentioned that this can happen outside of ELA class as well. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that, because I know that that's probably something difficult for teachers is, okay, how do I take this and apply it to science or social studies or math? <laughs> sure, sure. And I will say that part of the book is a whole section on how to read aloud in music class. In music, you can... Um, take there are so many musicians Coldplay and Bob Dylan and Aretha Franklin all these people who um, have picture book versions of their song lyrics song lyrics are essentially poetry so maybe you um, have the kids read the book and imagine what the music might be and then you you play the actual song for them and compare and contrast the differences between what they envisioned and what the actual book is so i'm just focusing on music but there's even ways to do it in physical education um i believe that the same process can happen across content areas but i think we have to be mindful that as content area teachers our read aloud may look differently. It may not look like the 15 solid minutes of sitting in your rocking chair, um, <laughs> doing a you know beginning, middle and end, start to cover book. It might be, you know, I read aloud for three minutes from um, a, a speech that a politician that we're studying made um, or a um, war decree in whatever history unit we're studying or in a science class, I can take um, a newspaper article. Um, you know, today, as we talk, we are living through this particularly hot week. There's all these newspaper stories about rising temperatures. Well, grab a newspaper and do a you know ten um, you know a, a ten minute read aloud of the of the paper. So it doesn't have to be a picture book. There's so many things to read aloud from speeches and letters and newspaper articles and magazine articles and the sports page for our, our PE teachers that I think we sort of have to just um, fight the notion that a read aloud is like rocking chair, picture book. Um, it, it, it doesn't have to be that experience. Such a good point. You know, it's interesting because uh, Melissa and I love, uh, obviously, like Tim Shanahan. And he recently, I'll bring this up because I think it's so fun to think about, he recently um, did a podcast, but it's, it, I don't want to say, but, and it's his weekly blog. He's reading it and I love hearing his voice. I love listening to it. And it's funny. Cause I feel like the first time I listened to it, I was like this, wait, I don't think this is like an actual podcast by the definition of a podcast. I think it's a read aloud, which is thoroughly enjoyable, but it, you know, it's, it confused me for a minute. And then I was like, okay, it's really a read aloud of his blog, which I, actually prefer listening to rather than reading because I love hearing his voice so it was just it's just really funny that you know even as an adult I'm like oh okay now like we have this podcast forum but he's really doing a read aloud on that podcast forum and I think it's <laughs> so fun to listen to that but it's it's doing that in a way that brings me the con that like content like you just said right it's a, an article that comes out weekly it's a blog that comes out weekly and now I have another way to access that as an adult and you're, you're um, tapping into something that I, as an adult reader, do when my book group chooses a book that I think is tough to get into. I start listening to it as an audio book. It's my entry point. And usually what I find is that the, by activating my background knowledge and setting the context and all of those things that listening does, um, I'm then more likely to be able to continue the book as the traditional, you know, read the hard copy or read on my Kindle or what have you. So um, I think that's an important thing that we can keep in consideration for our kids as well, that as we have them listen to a read aloud, be it us or be it the, you know, the, the podcast or even um, publishers now are coming out with audio files of their um, textbook, that that's a great entryway into difficult text. 
Yeah, I feel like that's a perfect transition to talking about students at all grade levels. Uh, like I know you mentioned in the beginning, and you've we've been re- you've been reiterating it throughout. Like read alouds are not just rocking chair K two you know kindergarten experiences. Um, and I know that was some of my favorite time as a fifth grade teacher, Melissa. I'm so glad that you had that conversation with a fifth grade <laughs> teacher recently. Like I have such fond memories of reading to my students. I even when I taught high school, I read aloud to my students and I, they were always surprised, you know, and I, I just thought, Oh, this is like a great time to calm yourself down and, and listen. But I'm wondering about the benefits of reading, you know, aloud to students at all grade levels. And is there different purposes at different ages? Well, the purpose I think for all of um, readers and um, is that language comprehension, that we are giving them exposure to background knowledge, that we are activating um, their purposes for reading and their motivation, not to mention all of the socio-emotional benefits that come from listening to a read aloud. Um, when we read aloud to a larger secondary class, we are opening the door for juicy conversations um, by sharing a common text. Um, So I think there's so much benefit around that. Um, But we also know that kids' comprehension, it, it, it lags behind their listening comprehension until about seventh or eighth grade, meaning that we, as we read aloud to kids, we are able to give them access and opportunity to more difficult texts than they would be able to encounter on their own. And that is so important, especially um, for our kids who may be struggling readers, um, to gain, to sort of equalize the playing field in terms of their background knowledge and the content that they need access to, um, to become proficient readers. So we really have to be mindful that it isn't until late middle school that our comprehension and our listening comprehension sort sort of start to match. That's really helpful, Molly. I, oh, I have a question in my mind, and I don't, I don't have it fully formed yet, so we'll see where it goes. <laughs> um, but what I was just thinking when you were talking is that, you know, when I was a teacher, I, I felt sometimes like I used read-alouds really well, and other times when I, I didn't necessarily. And I think the times I did match up with the things you're talking about, which was like, this is going to be a really tough text for my students or section of a text for my students. So we're going to, you know, I'm going to read it out loud to them and we'll work through it together. Or I just want to like show them my thinking in some way that, that I, I don't think that they'll be able to do. But other times I will say, I felt like I was just like, we need to move through this fast. So I'm going to read it out loud. <laughs> and I'm wondering if you have any like cautions against that, like just reading out loud just to kind of rush through a text versus like all this really rich discussion and the the, the talk of read alouds that you're talking about today. Yeah, well, I think we also we have to be mindful that there is that that what you talked about is actually a um a strategy, a purposeful strategy that effective proficient readers use. They adjust their speed for a reading Um, either silently or orally, according to their purpose, their engagement, all of those things. Um, I'm a reader that when I encounter, you know, paragraphs of really descriptive language of a setting, I'm like, flip, 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 (laughs) get get me to the action. Um, And that's that's actually using strategy and purposeful. And if you think about, you know, the Scarborough's Rope, those two strands coming together are with intention and strategy and purpose. So um, I think it's okay to speed through parts of a read aloud that may not um, be as engaging or to choose parts of a read aloud that are more difficult or, um, and I think it's also really important to say to our kids, I'm going to read this, this paragraph has a lot of juicy language. So I'm going to read it out loud to you, but the next page you guys are going to read on your own so that you're sort of alerting kids of the explicitness of what you're doing as you read aloud and as you model whatever you're going to do in that per- in that particular moment. Yeah, what I'm hearing you say is like, it really matters as a teacher to, to plan that out, your number one. <laughs> what, what was the E for that one? Evaluate. Evaluate yep. the text for that for those different purposes. Like when does it make sense for you to, you know, you might not always have all those questions to ask and think alouds to do and vocabulary. It might sometimes be just reading more quickly and you 
if you evaluate the text, you can plan that out. And at times it might, this is the time when it makes sense for the students to be reading. And, and it, it sounds like you're saying, Molly, too, that I would say even more as in the older grades, um, it might go back and forth. Like it doesn't have to necessarily be a set, I'm reading aloud for 20 minutes. <laughs> that's all that's like happening a gradual in this release. time. <laughs> right, like it's not going to look like that. So like neat and clean. Absolutely. And one of the things, um, I, uh, I spent um, nearly two decades um, as a uh, university professor working in pre-service teacher preparation. And I went into um, one of my pre-service teacher's classrooms to do a um, observation. And her read aloud was pulling up a video of somebody else doing a read aloud. They, you know, there's so many out there. They're on YouTube and, um, you know, the the, uh, storylineonline.net. And um, they were so prevalent during the pandemic as all sorts of publishers and authors were um, allowing people to do um, videos. And, And I those hold a certain purpose, but what they miss is they miss the opportunity for um, the interactiveness of a read aloud. They miss the opportunity for a teacher to literally read the room of how her students are responding and either looking confused or looking really bored. And um, they just don't allow us the flexibility that we would um, to be to be responsive to our kids in that classroom moment. And that kind of connects to what you're saying, like coming back to the audiobooks, right? Like there might be a certain purpose for using audiobooks that have a great benefit, but you also want to do this interactive part of a read aloud, which you couldn't do with a, an audiobook. For sure. And, and we adjust our instruction um, day by day and, and even minute by minute. So um, I, I certainly think as long as we're able to rationalize our decisions, I am going to read this paragraph out loud because of this, or I'm going to have kids partner read here, or I'm going to have them um, read um, silently here, um, whatever, as long as you're able to justify it. Um, but again, we really need to make sure um, that those read alouds continue, particularly in the areas that we know they're declining, which is upper elementary school, which is secondary school, which is those content area classrooms. So Molly, what would you say we read aloud in content area classrooms? Like, can you give, I know you, you shared earlier, but like, can you give a practical example to a teacher listening? Sure. So um, let's choose. Well, I think I talked through a music one. Um, Yeah. So if I were an art teacher, there are so many biographies of um, particular artists. There are, um, you know, there's a fabulous picture book about the the, um, inventor of Crayola crayons um, that I could read to my kindergartners. Every kindergartner uses crayons in some capacity. Um, If I were a gym teacher and um, I were introducing whatever new sport, I could go to the, let's just say, for example, I am teaching volleyball. Well, there's a National Volleyball Federation. I could go to their website and pull up the rules of volleyball. And rather than me explaining them, I could literally read the kids the rules and then think aloud because chances are those rules that are written in the very formal language are not going to be immediately accessible to my kids. Um, If I were in um, a science classroom, I mean, science, there's just so many ways that it's hard for me to just choose one. One, I know. (laughs) Um, um, I, uh, I actually, in the book, I talk through um, using picture books as an entry point into really difficult scientific concepts. Um, The math example I use is fractals, and the science um, example I use is a book about um, nanospectography, which is like the really complex chemistry um, explanations. I was a terrible high school student, but I know if my teacher had pulled out a picture book that's an explanation of, you know, in a in a social studies class, here's the picture book version of, um, you know, the history of the Middle East peace crisis, or here's a um, picture book that explains, um, you know, evaporation or what have you. It would give me an entry point, which builds the background knowledge for whatever text that I am then going to um, use on a in, a in a deeper read. 
And I'll just say, Molly, because I have a four-year-old, and that's why I'm reading (laughs) books all the time to him. And I learned so much, especially science, to be honest with you. I mean, it's the planets, the sun and the moon, the volcanoes, like, you name it, like all these kinds of things that uh, they're they're very easy to understand, but you get a lot of information from them. There are and um, talk about like making things accessible. Um, the other thing that we know about the data around read alouds is that um, the vast majority of read alouds are um, older books. They are the books that we loved. And I did this myself. I remember um, reading the book Hatchet to my kids, my sixth grade kids who lived in the middle of downtown Oakland, had no outdoorsy experience. This was before you know, the TV shows about Survivor and things like that. It was a (laughs) total flop. And um, I think we also have to have the courage to abandon a read aloud that um, isn't going well. (laughs) Um, But I think we also have to push ourselves to read aloud from things that are more current um, and not just always go to that, oh, I read this book every year. My, I love it. So therefore, my kids love it um, because there are so many. It's hard to stay on top and with the current publications of just how much comes out on a daily basis and the richness of um, the diversity of not only the content, but who's writing it and the perspective and all those things. Um, and so at the end of the book, I provide some lists of here are some of my favorite awards, resources, um, ways to stay current, because um, what we know is that most teachers sort of revert to the read alouds that they always do, or um, they're, they're just a, a small minority of read alouds today um, are books that are published within the last five years. Yeah. I, those examples are so helpful. I can't wait to check out the the list in your book. Um, but I do want to say too, like, thank you for expanding my view on that. Like the gym example that you gave, uh, for example, reading the, the, the volleyball directions. That's, I think, a really cool example. That really helped me kind of like conceptualize it and put it in for different content areas. Because a lot of times it seems like, all right, I can get this for ELA. I got this for for science, for social studies or history, but like, what would I do in gym? What would I do in art or music? So thank you for those extended examples. And that's such a good example. Like the directions might have that language that is a little bit more formal. And then that's a great opportunity for that think aloud and and making that thinking visible. So thank you for that. And it, it does, I think, provide all of the, like the Velcro for the knowledge that's about to happen coming forward. So yeah, and it's an exciting, um, as in the last couple of years, all of this coverage around the science of reading has emerged. Um, we're now, I, I think, starting to see more conversations about the importance of language comprehension and background knowledge, thanks to, you know, podcasts like yours and the work of people like Natalie Wexler. Um, and so all of these, as we think about the purpose of a read aloud, be it a kindergarten classroom or an eighth grade classroom, it is all about that language comprehension, that um, top part, those unconstrained parts of Scarborough's rope. And so when we think about how do read alouds fit into the science of reading, well, you can't talk about the science of reading without language comprehension. And how do you build that and activate that and scaffold it and support it for kids through read alouds? Yeah, because we know that we hear some people who say, you know, wait until they get the get 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 the decoding down and and then they'll learn then they can read on their own to learn all of the language comprehension parts but we know we all know <laughs> we can't wait until then absolutely and, and, not and we have yeah and we also have to remind our older kids just as we can't wait with the younger kids we also have to show our older kids if they are in their, you know, sixth grade social studies class or their eighth grade music class, that reading matters to us. It matters to our classroom culture, and it's how we build our knowledge. Um, and a read aloud is a great way to model that. Yeah, and I love what you said. I'll just like put a stamp on that too. Is that it also is an opportunity to read text that would be really difficult for the students to read, right? Then you have the opportunity to be able to help them through a text that instead of letting them struggle through it, you can help them through it. Yep. Yeah. Well, Molly, is there anything else about read alouds that you want to touch on before we wrap up? 
Well, um, I do just want to point out that I specifically focused on K through eight, but I don't want the message to be that high school teachers and college teachers and, you know, people of working with learners of all ages, there is no unintended message here that read aloud should stop at grade eight. So um, I, you know, I so love hearing about high school teachers who it's a part of their classroom. Um, but my specific focus was on grade through grade eight, but that does not in any way say that, you know, we stop reading aloud when yeah. kids move on to high school or what have you. And before kindergarten too, right? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Love that. Thank you for that. So, uh, do you want to share the title of your book and, and tell us a little bit about it? Sure. So it's a Solution Tree publication. Um, and I believe it's actually one of Solution Tree's first um, forays into literacy. They have a whole lot of um, professional development material for other content areas, but not as much in literacy. Um, and it's called Read Aloud for All Learners. And um, I was thrilled to have Natalie Wexler, who I know um, has been a frequent visitor on your podcast, write yeah. the foreword. Um, and um, I will also offer that um, that there's a huge amount of research in it. And if you are a teacher or a learner or um, whatever your role is that actually wants the direct research, like if you want to dig into the PDF of the research and can't get to it because it's behind a paywall, I will happily share it with you. Um, so don't let that stop your learning just because it's, you know, in an academic journal that you don't have access to. Thank you, Molly. And so it's read alouds for all learners um and molly ness is our guest today we'll have this linked in the show notes and um molly we will make sure we have a way for uh listeners to get in contact with you if they'd like the research uh through our show notes as well i would love to follow up with any anybody who's um who's interested in more and also to hear your ideas i mean teachers could not be the more they are the most innovative creative um people and to hear how people are reading aloud in ways that i couldn't even think of um because i know they're out there and happening on a yeah. daily basis in classrooms all over yeah we've had teachers actually send us videos before like on facebook and stuff from the things that we've talked about on the podcast and they're like i do it this way in my classroom that's so fun i love that I, so oh i hope i get some of those i would <laughs> yeah. love that let's see maybe we can get some read aloud videos it sounds great yeah, <laughs> we can send them we can send them along to you molly <laughs> perfect well thank you um, this was so helpful and informative and like most importantly super practical i i just i'm so grateful that you came on the podcast to share this and and that you wrote a book thank you for doing that well it's um every time i i do a book i say i'm never doing another one again and then um <laughs> so we'll see this might be my last but who knows so um i i look forward to feedback and in ongoing conversations from um whoever, whoever has dug into it Sounds great. Thank you so much. Thank you.